And ladies and gentlemen, he's one of the all-time greats, my buddy, Mr. John Wayne. You're listening to the John Wayne Gritcast with me, Ethan Wayne. The hell I was. We're talking all about the life and legacy of my father. John Wayne. Mr. John Wayne. John Wayne is the United States of America. Slap some bacon on a biscuit and let's go. This is the John Wayne Gritcast. In this episode, we have David Corso uh, with us and Molly Kasouf. David is the uh, CEO of CMG, Corso Marketing Group. Yeah. Uh, and Molly is the race director for the John Wayne Cancer Foundation's Grit Series. Uh, and we're just here to have a conversation. We've got no agenda. Thanks for having us in your Perfect, house. Perfect, because I have no energy <laughs> right now. We know you were up till <laughs> three or four in the morning last yeah, night. Yeah, last night was a late one in Pioneer Town. <laughs> and we were talking as we were coming in. I'm just trying to remember how... We first crossed paths. Uh, well, is it Danny it's Saul? the infamous Danny Saul. Is that how we first met? Yeah, it is how we first met. And yeah. that's because you had purchased Main Street. Oh, yeah, that's what it was. We, did we do a run before we knew him? No. You were looking to do I, a yeah. run. Yeah. I had to reach out to you and Adam for approval. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. You sent Molly to do the dirty work. I did it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. Well, because we were, we were working with the previous owner, right. and they were all on board. Didn't we do a run with her? We or it went virtual. virtual. Okay, yeah. so COVID hit. We couldn't do the run, but we'd established a relationship. And then when COVID ended and we were going in person, you had since purchased that property, and you were a mystery. Nobody would say Nobody your would name. Tell us. Nobody would say <laughs> who mystery. it was or if they were willing Incognito. to talk. Incognito. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and, and it, it turned out that you were uh, a good sport and super helpful and supportive. So we oh, you guys thank have you a great cause. Yeah. Yes, that was a fun time. Looking forward to that. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad we booked that date because me too. It's insane right now. Everybody's okay. trying to book that place, and everybody wants to do something in Pioneer Town. And mm-hmm. you guys have the date all locked and loaded. Nailed it. Yeah, we're excited. <laughs> yeah, we're excited to do it again, excited. bigger Pine- and better. Pioneer Town's an enigma to me <clears> because <throat> this is a place that I came when I was probably. Eight years old, and I came with a kid in my neighborhood whose dad took a motorcycle riding, and I love motorcycles. And the dad had a friend out here. I don't know if it was in Pioneer Town or Yucca, but we came out here and we'd ride motorcycles. And my entire life, I thought about coming back to this place. And you know, I met Danny two or three years ago and ended up getting a piece of property. And from the time I got that property till now, so much has changed. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's uh, it's incredible what's going on in some this Some people say for the good, some people say yeah. for the bad. Yeah, well, but it's, it's everywhere though. Times it's not just change. Here. You know, there's there's a lot of people running around, and uh, we're all looking for cool, fun places to be. Exactly. Um, but going back to the enigma status of David Corso. <clears throat> Because remember, Danny wouldn't tell us who it was. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. a complete, like... <laughs> wouldn't connect us. Wouldn't do... Yeah. Not sure if it was going to happen. Yeah. So now today we have an opportunity to get back to the beginning of you. Get to the real yeah. story. We want to yeah. know. And now the rest of the story. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I guess we know you're from Mississippi. We Born know and raised in Mississippi. Yeah. Born and raised in Mississippi. Um, I'm the baby of seven. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Baby of seven. Um, My mom is Creole. Her dad went from Cuba uh, to New Orleans. Well, he went from uh, Spain to Cuba and then Cuba to New Orleans. And he was a translator on the docks in New Orleans. And at 17, my grandmother came from France and stepped off the boat. And they met in the port. And that was it. They fell in love. And, you know, she had the, the white gloves and the... You know, like very high society French, and he was like a scrapping Spaniard. You know, it was oh. like the most unlikely to. Uh, so, and then my daddy came from Italy, and their family landed in New Orleans. And my mom and dad met when they were seventeen, eighteen. Uh, my mom ran away and snuck out her window and got on the back of my dad's bicycle, and uh, they took a Greyhound bus to Biloxi, Mississippi, from New Orleans, and were. They were, they were uh, 17, 18 years old. They were married on the beach. Incredible. And, uh, that was it, you know, and had a great life. And uh, my mom passed away at 94. It was wow. amazing. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, so I uh, 
Born and raised there, and then um, I was in the radio industry, actually, so with the microphones here, <laughs> bring it all back, you know? Um, I was general manager of a radio station down there, I was in the nightclub industry, so in this entertainment media world, and uh, couldn't make any money selling advertising. It was an alternative station. It was one of the first on the air in the United States, and... Uh, Back then, alternative was purple hair and nose rings, you know, like, and, and the brands wouldn't attach to it. So we uh, decided I was going to do a festival. Let's do a festival. And I had no idea what I was doing. And um, did a festival, sold 20,000 tickets. And one of the funnest parts of the festival was the element of bringing a brand in and doing something cool with a brand so the brand just wouldn't you know like the brands are like well i'm gonna pay a sponsorship what does that get me and i was like i don't know <laughs> i'll think of something you know and i started thinking of activations ways the brand could integrate with the, the festival and the fans and uh fell in love with that so it kind of brought together my background of entertainment and media and the marketing and put it all together and then um that radio station got sold and i literally packed the truck and drove out to california and uh new orleans is kind of a fast paced place you know i guess you could say so i needed to slow down a little bit <laughs> and they provided me that opportunity <laughs> and you couldn't get any slower in pioneer town again yeah so uh so yeah so came out to the west coast and then um but like Bay Area, Oakland, so where you went first? I drove in. I had visited San Francisco a few times, and I drove the truck across the country and landed in Oakland. And I really didn't know Oakland from any, you know, I, I just rolled into the town, and I, I pulled into a Motel 6, I think it was. And Motel 6 had like a 10-foot gate around the whole thing. <laughs> and I kind of <laughs> looked at that and woke up the next day and I realized I was in the middle of a pretty rough place in Oakland. <laughs> and uh, got a job in radio. And it was right during the dot-com thing. And, and, and all the brands were really looking to you know do something different with the media. And started doing some events with the radio station. And then... Um, I had the opportunity, some of the brands were, hey, can you do this for us in other markets? So then I started my agency and just kind of took off wow. all of a sudden. And kind of in the right place at the right time, I think, also. And was it always Corso Marketing Group? Oh, Lord, no. I've tried to, I've tried to <laughs> drop the Corso name about 100 times. Integrated Marketing Network, Corso Communications, Corso Agency, now CMG. And, and I've tried to change it because I've always felt like, I don't want my name on the... So as you know, I like to be kind of incognito, and uh, we would talk to the brands and the clients, like, we're going to change the name, and like, you can call it whatever you want, when we want you, we're just going to say, call Corso, <laughs> and it's like, so I gave up trying to change, get my name off the door, uh, but uh, it's been a good run, yeah, and COVID hit, of course, and, uh, you know, kind of set everyone back, and during that time, I'd been up to Pioneer Town a bunch over the past 20 years, and um, opportunity came, and I was bored out of my mind so how did you end up coming down to the desert in the first place was it the festivals yeah it was the festivals so was um coachella. coachella yeah so uh i had the great opportunity to meet a gentleman by the name of paul tillette he's the head guy from golden voice uh golden voice is the founder of coachella i started working with paul t in la um clubs that they had and live music venues and my client Heineken wanted to get in the, the, the music space and uh, so we started doing sponsorships of their different events and uh, Paul T and I were playing in a putt-putt golf fundraiser with my client from Heineken and he approaches us and he's like hey I gotta tell you guys something you know I need some help, I need some sponsorship, I'm gonna do this festival in Coachella. And I was like, what's Coachella? Where's Coachella? I hadn't ever heard of Coachella. And he's like, oh, it's like two and a half hours out into the desert. And 
I honestly, I looked at it and I was like, that's an awful idea, Paul. <laughs> no one's going to drive to the desert two and a half hours away to go to a festival. I was like, no, no, you got to see it out there. It's gorgeous. And so we drove out and of course the, the palm trees and the acres of grass and it was a gorgeous spot, the location where the festival is on the polo grounds. And so... Uh, I think the sponsorship was like five grand back then, wow. you know, and, and we did the festival. And what, what year is this? chaos, you know, 1999. <clears throat> and the festival happened for two years, and um, we were the first agency on the ground with them doing production and bringing sponsors into the show. And uh, I have so much respect for those guys, just what, what they've accomplished. And we do festivals now all over the world and uh, still... Coachella is one of the best run, best operated shows. So we've created a partnership with Golden Voice over the years. And, and um, I don't know if you remember the Desert Trip show with the Rolling Stones. And uh, that was an amazing show. Some people called it Old Cella. Um, oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Now you yeah. Now yeah, I know yeah, what you're yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we, we, we do work with the festival and we build elements at the festival, bringing sponsors with the festival. So a lot of times people would be like, oh, the guy from Coachella. And it's like, well, I've been working with Coachella for so long. They've kind of attached that brand to me. And proud of it because it's been a great run. It, was it a success from day one? Absolutely or? not. Uh, yeah. Uh, they lost so much money the first two years that they actually stopped it a year and uh, kind of reformatted the show. It was more of a rock show in the beginning. And uh, tradition is you do a country show, you do a rock show, but you never cross the genres. You never kind of do a show with pop and everything together and um paul t being the pioneer that he is he's like nope i'm gonna do it all you know and he did and people said it wasn't gonna work and all of a sudden it took off cool and uh, they changed the date on it and uh it just took off and it's just such a well-run show and he's really uh set the the boundaries on you know what can and can't be done in the festival world and then when it went to two weekends he was like, well, I'm not doing two weekends unless I can do the same bands both weekends so everyone gets the same experience. And it was like, there's no way you're going to rebook 150 bands, whatever it is, over, you know, and rebook them and hold them for two weeks. That's going to be impossible. And he did that too, you know, and it's the only show so that does that. So that's how it works. There's two weekends two of the same, same bands. bands. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's no other how, festival how, like it in the like, world. What's the scale of this event? I know it's massive. It's 125,000 people per day for two weekends. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and, the, and the demand on the tickets is so great that they could literally sell out five weekends if they could, if they had the bandwidth to do five weekends yeah. so and then they do stagecoach on the third weekend and so yeah. coachella then led to stagecoach and then coachella led stagecoach and stagecoach has drawn, grown really dramatically in the last couple of years and that show is i think sixty-five thousand now and and you'll probably see it grow so coachella's twice the size of stagecoach coachella's twice the size of well it's not just twice the size two weekends as well i see you know stagecoach so, is stagecoach one, is one. Mm -hmm. yeah so so, I mean, I can remember as soon as I got my driver's license, I was coming out to the desert. And you used to get to Palm Springs, and there'd be a little drive, and then you'd get to Palm Desert, and then there'd be another little drive, and then there'd be this big gap before you got to Indio, and Indio was basically just date palms. Yeah, when we first got out in the desert, there was nothing. You know, there was, we used to take stacks of paper tickets to promote the show. And we would get a limousine. It was the only one in the desert. And it was a just beat up limo. And the guy had three dogs in the limo, the driver. And the dogs would be running around the limo. We'd stop at little bars and restaurants and like hand out paper tickets to people to promote the show. Now there's no tickets. It's all wristbands and RFID. To get them to, to, to go to the show and what promote do you think, the show. When did you see it really start to go? Like, was there something After that about you seven did years? You know, it's just, you know, people coming every year, just more people, more people coming out to the desert and people talk, you know, and there's no better advertising or marketing than, you know, a happy fan. Yeah. And then, uh, and the level of artists that he was booking was just incredible. He's, he's an amazing, he's, he's, a, he's the best booker that, you know, you can think of. So 
Um, so the bookings and, you know, people just started coming out to the desert and it really was when the Palm Springs area and the desert area really started to grow. Coachella was the foundation for that because mm -hmm. it brought so many people to the desert and people were like, oh, this is gorgeous out here. And, and how do you guys handle like going from, you know, a, a little sponsor, <clears throat> right? You're trying to talk a guy into sponsoring it to now you're probably having to be a gatekeeper. They can't. It's, it's incredible. The sponsorships that they do out there and. And hey, it's just Finn, such a good... We're doing a podcast, buddy. Yeah. yeah. You gotta you gotta quit whining. <laughs> he's he's ready to go. He doesn't want to just sit around. Uh, yeah. Sorry. That's all right. So so anyway, it's 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 grown dramatically and you know, now it's all big brands and you know, it's they're 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 really struggling, you know, like they don't have room for any more sponsors. Mm. And and um Paul T tries to maintain such a high quality of the festival, like, you know, what he'll allow a sponsor to do and not do. So he's, he's very driven on the, the fan experience, mm. you know. So he doesn't even like the VIP area. You know, he's tried not to have a VIP. He wants everybody to have the same experience. Same experience. Yeah, so uh, you have to get out there, you know. Come on out this year. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm like on the too old, no, too old level. I've never yeah. been. A They'll special all. Uh, I will. I will kill the vibe if I go out there. <laughs> no, you won't. Coachella was Coachella's like, brought down by one old guy. <laughs> well, that that's came the out. funny thing. You go around and you'll see like a parent and their kid. You know, experience it because the different people at the show, whether it's a Beyonce and some new band you've never heard of, you know, and and. Uh, that was a funny thing with with Desert Trip too, with the Stones and Who and all those bands. Like we were shocked. We thought it was really going to be such an older crowd, and you saw, you know, twenties and forties, fifties, sixties. They're iconic. Yeah. Even, even with John Wayne, you know, we we just had a had a company do like a focus group, and they come back and they're like, right down to twenty one. Like, oh, it's incredible. Like, 86% positive this, you know, they're just blown away. But yeah. it's those iconic brands that, you know, they carry through the generations. Well, your dad certainly was like, I can remember as a kid coming home from school, it was like a three o'clock Western movie time that was every day on channel. like channel 26 that you even remember. Like, <laughs> and boy, I would plant myself in front of that TV and... Uh -huh. You know, as a kid, you know, I had the hat and the guns. Really? <laughs> Try to imitate your that. dad. Oh, oh, it was awful. I wouldn't even do the imitation. But uh, yeah, he was a, he was just a hero to so many kids, you know, and it's mm -hmm. such an inspiration. Like, like what a what a tough sob he came across in his movies. You know, was he as tough as and that? He was, but he was also the most loving, the kindest, the most generous person that you could ever hope to meet. And he was large, right? He was a large oh. format man. He was a very, very big, big guy. And he was attacked recently, you know, by some people who had, had an agenda. Oh. And, uh, it, you know, it was, it was interesting because we, you know, like we represent John Wayne, so we act like John Wayne. So we go, you know what, let's go find out what, what's the basis for all this. You know, what's all the noise about? We went back into the archive and we got into texture materials and we looked at the issue that that uh, people were talking about and we got his side of the story and uh, uh, we also started to realize as we're going through all this correspondence that he never said no to anybody. Like if somebody wrote to him and said, you know, I'm a big fan, I'm falling on hard times and I, I can't afford a baseball outfit for my kid's little league team, the check would go out. And, and the secretaries were so good that we have the incoming letter, the outgoing letter, a copy wow. of the check, and it's, it's every day, <laughs> multiple times a day, he's fulfilling requests for uh, causes or people or friends or family. Talk about an abundance of generosity and a gratefulness for the opportunity uh, for the life that he led. You know, he didn't take it for granted and he always helped. Wow. And, and he had a good line. He's like, yeah, I always give a fellow a second chance. 
but keep an eye on him. <laughs> <laughs> I recently looked up all his one-liners, and he's got some good ones. Oh, it's really good. He's got some and they're good all pearls ones. of wisdom. You know, they're timeless. Yeah. They'll never, they'll never go out of style. They'll always have good meaning. That's amazing. And so, anyway, I know we've we've drifted a little bit. No, but, no. But, you know, it's hard. It's hard to drift from your dad yeah, with media and marketing uh, is you know, really at, at, at the highest level that, that people can attain. And uh, we understand why it was tough to get a hold of you, you in the beginning. But once you and Molly connected, you were completely supportive. And well, I fell in love with Molly. Well, Mo- Molly, <laughs> Molly's easy to fall well, in love with. She's an amazing <laughs> person, you know, oh. like her dedication and her energy and her drive to the, the cause. Like you can't say no. <laughs> you know well good you're so sweet you yeah are. it was great to, it was great to work with her she's like a, and Molly's a <laughs> you know really you lucky. put on runs sort of on the coast there in El Moro for a long time mm-hmm. El Moro's a beautiful state park and it's you know it's a little bit difficult to deal with and she had you know years of experience like running these great races that everybody loved and when we decided to get into to racing you know I've known Molly for a while and we asked her if she'd come over and help and once we explained the setup, she was in 100%. So. Went running. And she's Literally. running. <laughs> yeah. And you haven't looked back. In, how many have we done so far? Because we kind of started and then COVID hit. Yeah. We did two the first year in 2019. Oh, it was that soon when you started and COVID hit? Yeah. Yeah. And then um, the second year was COVID. We did three virtually. And then 2020, we did... Or 2020 was the three virtual. 2021, we did five. Five. In person. How many on the slate for 2022? Um, plus five plus. Five plus. Yeah. You might add a couple. <laughs> one here in Pioneer Town. Was the last one was Fort Worth. It was Fort great. Worth, Texas. You it's know, amazing. Fort Worth. We've got you the exhibit, and there was a lot of support. And the stockyards is a really up and coming. Yeah. Uh, the hot area. Hot area, and <clears throat> uh, it was really fun. And we hope that you know we can do something really fun here in Pioneer Town. Oh yeah, I'm and, so excited. Uh, Pioneer then Town. Then we noticed safe. David not only not only has Pioneer Town. But you got the hay barn that I call it. The and soundstage, the hay barn. Of, the, every hay property feed. that I looked at, you'd already bought. <laughs> I know. It's like I was horse. bored out of my mind during COVID. <laughs> what else was a man to do? Know. You know. Well, we used to come out here uh, when, when we started the festival. We would like, what else is there to do out here? And someone pointed us to Pioneer Town at some point, literally 20 years ago, and came out here, and uh, it was really a ghost town that wasn't you know it had uh gone from being a popular movie set and um then it just kind of started going down boy i wish i'd have bought it then yeah uh, no kidding. <laughs> me too <laughs> jeez i can remember looking at a lot maybe over 10 years ago out here it was five thousand dollars and i was bickering with the lady <laughs> like oh my. i'll give you 49.50 and <laughs> Yeah, his lots are two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, you know, so slap myself for that. That really happened, like from when COVID turned on. <clears throat> this place kind of went up. Yeah, yeah. I, I bought a lot sort of right before it hit, and I thought it was expensive. And you know, in the last what? It just kept going. Eighteen to twenty-four 18, yeah. months. Yeah, the stuff's. And really, I, 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 it seems like it's going to continue for a while. The demand. Is it's really just, out it's there. a unique place. It's a unique lifestyle. It's in the desert, but we're at 4,500 mm. feet. Yep. Uh, it has the incredible rocks and plants and things. It's a, and it's a little chilly right now. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I love it. I mean, yeah. my so first like trip up here, you know, besides when I was a child, it was, you know, six inches of snow on the ground. So I really, really liked it. Yeah. And, and, and kind of what got me out here a lot too was when COVID hit, a lot of people that are come out here for the festivals, they were calling me like, hey, we know you're out there in the desert. You know, where should we stay? What should we do? And, you know, we're dying to get out of L.A. And so it just kind of sparked me. You know, I was like, well, maybe this is a good time to change paths <laughs> because, you know, all of our events were shut down. Mm-hmm. We couldn't do events. And I was trying to figure what to do with my staff. <clears throat> and I love hospitality coming from New Orleans and I love building and design and construction. And so, you know, I started buying houses here and there. And then we bought the land in Pioneer Town. And literally, it's just every weekend, I found myself hosting, you know, people, artists, friends, 
people from companies that I work with and it just hasn't stopped, you know? And so that business took off. All of a sudden I was in the real estate development business. Uh, Cause we were all curious, you know, what the heck you were thinking with Pioneer Town? Like, what are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I, I was, I was thinking. like. I just want some place like out there where nothing's going on, and then as soon as I close on it, everything starts happening. Here. <laughs> well, I kind <laughs> of grew fond to it. Um, I can remember my dad loved coming out t- to the west, and uh, you know we would get out of school at you know two o'clock, three o'clock, whatever time it was, and we'd walk out the front door of the school. And the station wagon would be there, the Vista Cruiser station wagon, and all the luggage strapped to the roof would be like, where are we going? My dad would put us in the car and we'd take off. And we would go oh, to all the, the Indian reservations and Western towns. And for me, that was the memories that, you know, for the family vacations, going to the Western little towns. And I loved it. And in Pioneer Town, I was like, this needs to be preserved. Because it really is one of the last ones uh, in, in the West, and it's been uh, deemed as a historic, been on the historical foundation now. And uh, when I bought it, people were like, "Oh no, that guy from Coachella is going to come in here and do a festival," and and it was just the opposite. I wanted to, you know, try to nurture the town because it was falling apart basically well it's a place know? that you liked uh, oh, i love personal it. affinity towards yeah it, you know, yeah too. but like you know the electrical panels and the water everything oh, was yeah. kind of because it was left unattended to um so you know the whole idea was to you know rebuild it make it better and then people were coming in droves during COVID, and they kind of explored it it became such a popular place again but there wasn't much for them to do, mm. you know, they were just kind of walk up and down the street, you yeah. know, and nothing to do. So, you know, opening up shops, uh, really the event we did with you guys was the kickoff to the first thing we did. And it was, it was so amazing. popular. People loved it. I could get, get goosebumps, you know, like they were like, that was so much fun. It was great for the community, the cause. Mm-hmm. It was, it was awesome. That's so. what I felt with the community here. Everybody came together to help. Everybody wanted to be involved. It's really not normal here in Pioneer Town. Well, it's good. <laughs> the community comes. So you guys you know, brought the community together. It was the amazing. Community's <laughs> concerned about change, and, and yeah, I absolutely. understand it. And and we wanted them to know, like, we're not here to change anything. No. It, the run, mm-hmm. you know, the, the the slowest guy is going to be two hours, and then mm-hmm. the run's over, and we're going to, you know, fix the trails and make sure we clean up the streets mm-hmm. and make sure that. That we leave things better than we found it. Yeah, people still talking about the race. The horses. It, it seems like we all got along. Like every everybody, faction, everybody yeah, and everybody wanted to help. Yeah. And everybody felt like I did hear like thank you for helping, keeping the community yeah. together. Yeah, it was and perfect. It, it was. Yeah. So looking forward to it again. What's the date, yeah. Molly? May seventh. May seventh, huh? Twenty twenty. Right. Coming cool. back. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited too. And you think we can squeeze some music in during the? That's the key. yeah. That's that's kind of the next little phase of the grit series. Bring some music and mm-hmm. do some music in the sound stage, and you know, and the food was popular too. People were getting food. Food and tracks were amazing. Have you ever listened to the Sunday night band at Pappy's? They've got like a local crew that show up and play on. Oh Sunday really? Night. It's called they the used Sunday to. night. And or I the came. Sundays. They still do that. I spent one night at Pioneer Town Hotel on my way to Arizona, uh, and. I went over and I got a steak at Pappy and Harriet's and this band was setting up and I was looking at the band going, these guys are all my age, you know, <laughs> and there was probably like six or eight people who showed up and they kind of knew each other and they, you know, it, it wasn't like, a, you know, REO Speedwagon, it was just a bunch of people that played and they played Neil Young and Crosby, Stills and Nash House and band. Jackson Brown. Yeah. And Fleetwood Mac, and they were so good. I asked, I, I'm when like, was that? How long who was is that? this band? And the guy's like, oh, that's Sunday. That's Sunday Night Crew. They Sunday don't even night. have a name. Nice, unbelievable. Nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Let's do some. Let's do some music out there. Sure. Yeah, they were. Uh, they were fun. really good. And Molly's gonna get me to 
run, I'm afraid, this year. You're running this year. I had an injury in my you foot. You had a little injury I had a, last year. He gets in better shape every time I see him. I know. He, I had a foot something. injury last time, so I couldn't run. You guys but. are both in great shape, but yes, yeah. you're both running. <laughs> and somehow we got out of that last That's time. Why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. You go, why do you have that? Well, you have a half marathon and then the short one, and you go, why do you have that? Like, so I can run something. Well, these trails back here are amazing. Amazing. You know, and just to go out the back door here, and go into the sawtooths, yeah. you know. And, and Pioneer Town, like prior to to our arrival, had done a good job preserving the mesas and the sawtooths. Yep. So hats yeah. off to the community yeah. for yeah, wildlands for thinking amazing. ahead and making sure that it's you know it's foot traffic and horse traffic. Yeah. Not, no bicycles, no motorized things. And it really keeps the landscape absolutely. Pristine. Yeah, and as rough as the desert is, it's very fragile. So it's it's nice that they've done that. Yeah, people don't understand that until they come and they see it and they mm -hmm. understand and they see what the fires did. You know, when you hike through there, you can see all the fallen Joshua yeah. trees right. and, yeah. and uh, the devastation that it took. And uh, you know, this is a tough subject. M my dad has a obvious film legacy, right? And then as he was dying of cancer. Uh, he asked his kids to use his name to, to help the doctors fight the disease, and, and we started on that a long time ago. And uh, so he set that in motion before. Yeah, yeah. Wow. he's in, in bed. Uh, I drove him to the hospital at UCLA when I was 17 in his station wagon. He was laying down in the back and uh, went around to the back entrance of UCLA, and <clears throat> you know, never for a minute did I think that he wasn't going to come out of there. Right. And he went in and it, it took, you know, it was about Came two on. months before he died and he ended up dying in there. Um, and it was a day we were all sitting there and he said, hey, use my name. Uh, so the John Wayne Cancer Foundation was born. Uh, the John Wayne Surgical uh, Oncology Fellowship Program was born. Uh, incredible research. Uh, was started and funded there. We created a translational research facility. So we, we took tenured uh, uh, PhDs and clinicians out of the UCLA Medical Center environment, put them in their own building. You got the, the uh, PhDs and the clinicians like in the same rooms right across the hallway from each other. They can interact faster. And when they need a machine or something done, we get it funded and we get them that. Wow that uh, awesome. unit quick and it drives the <clears throat> research forward because in the in the medical center environment and the, the academic environment it could take a year for them to you red know, tape you have to go yeah, through to, to get a new machine or or something that's awesome do. so anyway he, he was a pioneer in translational research you know 40 years ago monoclonal the uh, you know you hear like monoclonal antibodies you hear uh vaccine therapy for cancers you hear um uh, early, uh, you know, this liquid biopsy now, these early detection blood tests, all the, the seeds of all those technologies were really planted at John Wayne and, wow. and people don't know it. No, I had no idea until uh, the race I came across. If you're in cancer, you know it. If you're, you know, if you're outside dealing with cancer, you might not know that a lot of this, this technology came from John Wayne and that's a separate and significant legacy that was, that was left by him. And the runs are, are, you know, partly to get people off the couch and engaged in their own health and, and partly to, to get in front of people and talk to them about John Wayne and invite them to, to help in, in the fundraising and the support of all these programs that we have going. I think everyone's been touched by it, you know, yeah. some, somehow my, my oldest brother, I'd never up until 10 years ago, you know, um, never knew anyone really close that, that had, had cancer and my oldest brother passed away from cancer and, uh, you know, until you see the devastation and how fast it, it takes a person down and, mm -hmm. and sometimes you can't do anything about it. Yeah. You know, your hands are tied, you know, so thank you for all the effort. Well, you know, it's him. And there's a lot of terrible diseases that, you know, people can support and fund. This just happens to be ours. And, you know, if, if you've been with somebody who's died of cancer, it, it's a hard, it's hard for them and it's, it's hard for the people around them sometimes because you're, you're helpless to do anything for them. Uh, and I know you did a lot for your brother and can you, yeah, are I, you uh, okay talking about? He was in Houston at the time and I got a phone call and he said he was sick, didn't know what was wrong. And, so, and he was one of the kind that didn't want to go to the hospital ever or go to the doctor ever. So we um, drove down there, 
brought him to a doctor, brought him to an oncologist, and oncologist basically, I was in the room with them, and she said, you know, it's terminal. And uh, he kind of looked at me, looked at her, and I was devastated, and he just kind of shook his head, and he was like, okay. And he's like, can you take me home to see mom? And uh, he was in pretty bad shape, and I couldn't get a couldn't fly him and I couldn't get an ambulance across state lines and I was trying for how to get him home so I, I rented an SUV and I took his mattress from his apartment and I shoved him in the back and uh, made an ambulance out of the SUV basically and him and I drove across the, from Houston to New Orleans and uh, I hadn't spent that much time with my brother I don't think ever wow. quality time and as we went through the drive through the south, he told me the stories of, oh, that place there, and you know, I got arrested there at one time in a bar, or, you know, he told me he was, he was, he was kind of a renegade, and uh, it was really great to hear his stories and, and hear everything, and I got him home, um, and I, it was my birthday, actually. The day that I got him to my mom was the day of my birthday, and... Uh, Got him home. My mom was so happy to be able to see him. And, mm, you know, sure. we went to the VA hospital. And, you know, once you check in, and I was it. He never checked out. But uh, and it was hard for my mom because they always say it's really tough for a mom to see the sure. child, mm. you know, pass. So that was tough. And uh, that was my first experience with someone that was close to mm. me. And uh, to be like, I'm kind of a doer. And I was like, what do you mean I can't fix this? I can fix anything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it was, couldn't fix it. You know, and so uh, it was tough. And then got to see you guys and see what you do. And um, that's an amazing cause. I think once we heard that, we, you know, we understood more why you kind of like gave us a shot and, you know, maybe gave us some support. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, it's tough, but that's really you know you're a nice nice man you're a very kind person to do that for don't somebody don't you tell anybody that i'm no. not gonna tell anybody don't worry <laughs> and nobody, nobody listens to this out. podcast so your secret is safe <laughs> no it's amazing no but that's uh you know those, that's a that's a life experience yeah you can't you know yeah. you did a, a you did a really good thing for your brother wow yeah and to that's have that time to together too yeah that time was great but it makes you realize short life is and sure spend is. time with your family and your brothers and your sisters yeah. and don't let don't let it go away because all of a sudden it's gone and you wish you had my mm -hmm. sister and i have the same birthday i'm four years older but she was born on the same day and every year you know really we, yeah <laughs> i didn't even know that <laughs> I, it's the, and it's nine months after my dad's birthday so you go may 26 june july august september october november december january february 22nd Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, uh, yeah. And we'd buy each other like some silly thing. And finally, a couple of years ago, I'm like, I'm so sick of buying you stuff. Like, let's do stuff together. Like, let's no more gifts. Like, oh, let's nice. Let's just make a point of doing something. That's why I bought, bought my Sprinter van to take her and her husband and their kids. And we drove up to Seattle and we went around the Olympic Peninsula and we looked at a little place that we have up there. And, uh, they were moaning and complaining the entire way. <laughs> the kids were crabby. It was so funny. And now we look back and it was one of the greatest times we ever had. Nice. So, nice. yeah. You for those for who your, don't you know. You did that for your brother. Ethan is the it's van man. Van man. <laughs> the van man. <laughs> well, I wasn't until that trip. Yeah. Oh, that's no, good. You anyway. see the van. Well, David, I think we we covered most of what covered all the bases, huh? About. We left Molly out. We just... No, I'm... Drink coffee and talked over her. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 2022 is so right around the corner, I guess. Oh, it's here. I feel like we're coming off the cusp of 2021 stuff. It's here. Our calendars are slammed I already. Um, we're really excited because our first race of 2022 is here at Pioneer Town. Oh, it's the first race. The very first race. Yep. Yes. So what are you going to do for the next three months of Molly with your salary? You oh, go crazy. You're such no, a busy person. Yeah. Well, I, I'm leaving in the morning for Colorado <laughs> to do. I know it. Right? Yeah. I, we got, I got plenty of stuff going on. <laughs> um, and the second race is the Newport Coast, which is uh, June 4th. And then uh, Lone Pine again, October 15th. And we're working on, um, or for sure, Texas again, November 15th. 
and then we're working on another Arizona location possibly and going back to Colorado. We had a race originally in Colorado the first year, um, but then COVID hit, so we didn't go back. It's beautiful. We kind of got a balance where the races can be somewhat profitable and, you know, in a more urban environment like Fort Worth, and then we want to get people out and give them the John Wayne experience, you know, like maybe mm-hmm. up in Ridgeway, Colorado, near Telluride, where they filmed Two Grit. You know, so we won't get as many people there, but we'll right. give a terrific experience right. to the people Beautiful. who do this. Right. San Juan's, like so, and, and we work with, uh, we, we do work with the L.A. Marathon, the Boston Marathon. And uh, I think what's so different about your races is that those races, like, you don't enter those races unless you're a great runner, <laughs> you know, like they're very like, well, I'm not going to get in that. And, uh, your race, like everyone runs Yeah, everybody everybody runs. and you don't feel walk? intimidated, yeah. you know, it's for, a, it, it's for a cause. It's mm-hmm. not to win, right? you know, it's not to win for yourself. It's to win for the cause. Yeah. Yes. And, and that's what makes it so different, unique. It's, it's, it's got a family feel to it. The people are out there with their kids, and and it's really a lovely thing. Right, which thing. is so important to us, I think, as a foundation, is to let it be community. Let everybody be involved. If you don't want to run, you don't have to run. You can walk it. You bring a friend. Bring can I ride a horse? horse? No. <laughs> yeah, Pioneer Town. Actually, yeah, probably Pioneer Town. Pioneer Town. We should have. Uh, yeah. We should get Randy in the company. Yes, definitely. Well, when I uh, when when you came to us and you went through the race and you're like, oh, I gotta find a way to get the water out. You, were you, you know. Yeah, well, no. I'm not amazing. It's the people of the town. Like I, I asked a few people. I was like, hey, can you help me get the water? And like, no problem. Like everyone just jumped right Everybody in there. Did, yeah. Right in there. And, and you know what? If if you were to start something like this and not have your dad's name to attach to it I would imagine it would be so much harder but Mm -hmm. you say the John Wayne name and I don't know because I talk about it all the time now oh I met Ethan Wayne John John (laughs) Wayne's son I always brag about that that's my claim to fame you know I know John Wayne's son (laughs) and uh, yeah my friend (laughs) Ethan you know and uh and and everybody lights up and listens and uh it's really a, a lovely brand your dad left behind yeah he did. And coming you got in big boots races. to fill, as yeah, they say, do. huh? Yeah. yeah. And my mother was only five feet tall, so I'm not gonna <laughs> not gonna fill them all the way up. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you for uh, you know you guys and everything you do, and whatever we can do to help you, please let us know. Absolutely, you've been amazing. Yeah. Your support. We're really excited for right. anything you May want 7th. people to know. Like you want to drive them to a website or. Any upcoming events that you want to talk about? No, I want to keep people out of Pioneer Town, you know. <laughs> I'm getting to be like all the other locals here. Don't come. <laughs> it's really well, it's cool. It's great some dirt roads. You it's know? really like, cool. Whatever we do, don't pave the roads. Don't pave the roads. The roads and dirt. once you come here, you realize that. But for us, you know, it's important to, to just let people know when you come here. You know, just you, you got to respect the desert and respect the town and respect the community because yeah. there's some old timers that have been here for a long time, yeah. you know. And so, you know, you reminded me, you were talking about the, the station wagon ride with your folks across mm-hmm. the country and going to these places that meant something to you. When I'd go with my father, it was typically somewhere rural and we drove to a lot of these places. And it's tough today for me to get on an interstate and every off ramp is Starbucks, you know, Starbucks, Subway, you know, Taco Bell, Burger King, whatever it is, where in the old days you'd pull off and you're like, Hey, this is a, this is a, <laughs> this is a chicken fried steak place or this yeah. is a turkey sandwich yeah. place. Or, oh yeah. This is the it's great bacon place. Mm-hmm. I can remember that. And uh, pioneer town reminds me of one of those places. You know, yeah. This is the Pappy and Harriet's place. Mm-hmm. Right? Come Just here and get stuff the, over the cool stuff. My yeah. Those mom. are, Fond memories. My mom would stop the station wagon and pull out the red and white checkered tablecloth and drop the tailgate and put the checkered cloth on the tailgate and she would bust out the devil's ham and potted <laughs> meat and I could the things we would eat back then, you know? Because you know, like you're on the road, cheese and crackers, whatever it was. We had these little picnics on the side of the road, but the side of the road was so much different than the side of the road these days, you know, the yeah. interstates and, uh, but those were, those were good times. So. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to even find a place to pull over and 
So. Oh, yeah. Mm-mm. It's hard there to find. But That's why you pack your snacks yeah. like I do. Molly's good <laughs> at snacks. snacks. <laughs> <laughs> you ever see the Grit Series van going down the road? You, you know won't, snacks yeah, yeah. You won't go hungry. Nope. Follow Molly. Yep. Um, well, thanks, David. Thanks for talking to us. Uh, and and thanks my for pleasure. all the help you've given us. We look forward to it. Yeah, I look forward to it as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Molly. Thank you to my Keep us running. Thank you so much for listening to the John Wayne Gritcast. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you like what you heard, give us five stars in the Apple Podcast app and follow us on social media at John Wayne Official. Slap some bacon on a biscuit and let's go.